Every day, thousands of tons of ore are mined in pits like this one, scattered over the thousand or so square kilometers of the Pine Point Mines property in Canada's Northwest Territory. And the ore minerals are the shiny gray lead sulfide galena and the brownish zinc sulfide sphalerite. host rock in which these ores are found are limestones which were formed in a shallow reef environment about 400 million years ago. And those limestones have been extensively replaced by dolomite. But the ores themselves actually occur in underground collapse structures. And they form when subterranean cave systems in the limestones simply collapsed. And there were lots of spaces in amongst the jumbled chaos of boulders in these collapsed structures, and in those spaces, the ore minerals were precipitated. Now, associated with the lead sink, uh, sulfides at Pine Point, there are a number of other things. There's bitumen that's found in cavities in the rocks all over the place. That's natural bitumen. And there's this attractive yellow mineral that's native sulfur. And there's another sulfide, iron sulfide. And that oxidizes rather easily and it stains the rocks brown. In Devonian times, about 400 million years ago, the reef in which these lead zinc ore bodies are now found was a barrier between open sea to the north, where shales were being deposited, and an extensive shallow basin to the south where evaporites accumulated. But the reef itself, soon after it was formed, was uplifted. So there's a surface of erosion, an unconformity between it and the overlying shales which covered it later on when it subsided again. Well, so much for the summary of the geological relationship. Now, to, to understand the ore forming process, we need to consider three main questions. Those questions can be applied to any ore body anywhere in the world, not just here at Pine Point. The first question is, how was the ground prepared to receive the mineralization? The second question is, where did the necessary chemical elements come from and how were they transported? The third question is, what were the physical and chemical processes that controlled the precipitation of those elements in concentrations way above normal crustal abundance here. And we can consider each of those questions in the context of Pine Point, although, of course, they apply anywhere. The first question is, how was the ground prepared to receive the mineralization? Well, actually, that's not too difficult to uh, explain, because, of course, preparing the ground simply means making spaces available for the ore minerals to be precipitated in. And there are two main ways in which that's happened here. The first is by the formation dolomite networks with cavities in them, but much more important in the formation of the limestone collapse structures. On these rather thinly layered limestones, we can envisage rainwater and groundwater moving along cracks and joints and bedding planes. And because those waters are acid, they dissolve out layers of limestone to make rather flat cavern systems. Larger caverns would develop along those limestone layers that were more easily dissolved. Once the caverns got big enough, the roof began to fall in. And the result was mainly tabular collapsed structures. But there must have been some solution along vertical fractures as well. So in some places, there was a bell-shaped collapsed structure extending upwards. This whole process wouldn't necessarily happen all at once. It could take thousands of years. And if the vertical structure reached the ground surface, you'd get a conical sinkhole at the surface, just like this one. The ground is undermined by the collapse beneath, and it just simply falls into the hole. The next question is, where did the necessary elements come from, and how were they transported? I can answer that by using a simple geological cross-section. Fifteen kilometers from north to south, the limestones of the barrier with their ore bodies, marine shales to the north, 
the Zapite to the south, and the old fault in the Precambrian rocks beneath. Now the metals could have come from deep in the crust, using this old fault as a conduit. They could have come from the marine shales, because we know that marine clays absorb metals of all sorts, and that those metals are expelled with the pore waters as the clays compact to form shales. The metals that could have come from the evaporite, because the residual brines which remain after the precipitation of the evaporite salts are highly concentrated with respect to base metals, and so those waters could have moved into the valley. And there's a fourth possibility, the limestones themselves, because it's known that the calcite of marine limestones carries lead, zinc, and other metals in small amounts, metals which the calcite inher inherited from its parent seawater. But how could the metals have been released from the calcite? Well, the rocks have been extensively dolomitized, and dolomitization involves a complete reconstitution of the rock, and that process would have released the metals from the calcite into the pore waters. Now, sphalerite and galena are sulfide minerals. So where did the sulfur come from? The answer is easy to find, here in the evaporite. This is anhydrite rock, calcium sulfate. It's soluble, and so it releases sulfate ions into the pore waters. But how are those sulfate ions reduced to sulfide? Hydrocarbons. This is bitumen, and it's widespread throughout the whole of the Pine Point area. And the sulfate-reducing bacteria are known to reduce sulfate in the presence of hydrocarbons and they produce hydrogen sulfide as a waste product. So we have sources for the metals and also for the sulfur. Now, we don't know the age of the mineralization at Pine Point. No doubt it happened way back in the geological past. But there are processes operating here today at the surface which give us clues to the processes which may have been involved in the mineralization. Where the ground surface cuts into the water table, you get a natural flow of groundwater to form a spring. Well, this spring is not so uh, clean as it looks. I'm going to test it for metal ions. And to do that, I'm using one of these handy little strips, in the end of which there's some indicator in a tab, which is yellow. And when I dip it into the water, if it changes to shades of pink, that indicates the presence of zinc ions. And it's changing. Yes, it's a, a bright pink. And that shows there's more than 40 parts per million of zinc here. And there's lead as well in this water. Now, they've probably been dissolved out from an ore body, perhaps underneath this area. And that's hardly surprising in Pine Point. Now, there are quite a few of these little strip tests uh, for semi-quantitative stream geochemistry. And here's one uh, which I've just used here. It's for sulfate. This strip is how it starts off with three red patches. And when the sulfate ions present, the red turns progressively to a pinkish yellow color. And here's the result. All the tabs have changed. There's more than 900 parts per million of sulfate in the water. Now that's quite common in this part of Canada because down to the south of us, we have these enormous evaporites, and that's where the sulfate comes from by solution. So here, in this little spring, we have all three prerequisites for mineralization. We have zinc, we have lead, and we have sulfur in the form of sulfate ions. But there's no mineralization going on because lead and zinc sulfate are quite soluble. Now, about 15 kilometers away from here, there's a different kind of spring. See these bubbles? That's methane gas. Now there's another gas dissolved in this water, and it smells horrible, like rotten eggs, hydrogen sulfide. So there are sulfide ions in the water here. Now watch this. I'm going to take this piece of cloth, dip it in, 
lead acetate solution very carefully because it's quite poisonous and drop in the water. Instant ore body from black. So lead ions and sulfide ions have combined together to form lead sulfide, galena, pure and simple. Now this means that uh, there must be some mineralization still going on somewhere around Pine Point. But unfortunately, there's no zinc or lead ions in this water. So we don't get mineralization here. But something else rather interesting is happening. Where the sulfide ions come into contact with elemental oxygen formed by algae, you get elemental sulfur and water. As the sulfur forms beneath the surface, it bulges up. And there's sulfur in the pine point ores. So the analogy of these springs is very, very close to the sort of process we think went on during the pine point mineralization. The experiment with lead acetate showed that hydrogen sulfide can precipitate lead from solution to form lead sulfide, the mineral galena. The reaction was relatively rapid, and the same applies to zinc. Now here at Pine Point, the ore minerals are not disseminated throughout the limestones and the dolomites of the barrier in a random fashion, but they're concentrated in particular places. In those places where the ground had been prepared by dissolution and collapse. And so the likelihood is that the critical reactions occurred in those places where we now find the ore body. Now the mineralizing fluids were no doubt extremely dilute with respect to metals. Not so dilute perhaps as the natural waters that we've seen at the surface here around Pine Point, but they were different because the mineralizing fluids had their origins from seawater. So they were, in a sense, brine. Because of their low metal contents, vast quantities of these brines must have moved through a site of ore deposition to produce even a moderate-sized ore body, and that would have taken a long period of geological time. No deposition of ore minerals would have taken place, however, if there had not been a continuous supply of hydrogen sulfide over that same period and at that same place reaction between hydrocarbons and sulfate ions from the anhydrite rocks would have produced hydrogen sulfide. Using methane as the simplest hydrocarbon, a likely reaction would be where the hydrogen sulfide met the metalliferous brines, there would have been immediate precipitation of lead and zinc as the sulfide minerals galena and sphalerite. They met where the ground had been prepared in zones of collapse, because those were open conduits into which migrating fluids were naturally funneled. There too, the large voids between the fallen blocks offered space for major accumulations of ore. Now we know something about the setting in which these ores were formed. We know the way in which the ground was prepared, and we think we have some ideas about the reactions which were involved. And this information helps us to look elsewhere in the world to try to find those places which might have been similarly mineralized. But any ore body, even the large one, is a small target. And how does the geologist pinpoint those targets? How is it done here at Pine Point? In some parts of Canada, there's a big problem for exploration. A lot of the area is plastered with boulders and clay brought by very powerful ice sheets from hundreds of miles away. That's the top of the bedrock, and all the rest is boulder clay. So the geochemistry of soil, the vegetation, and of stream sediments bear no relationship to the geochemistry of the underlying rock so you can forget about geochemical surveys. What we need is a geophysical method to see through the boulder clay. Now, galena and sphalerite are non-magnetic. 
So the choice is down to electrical survey methods that rely on the electrical properties of sulfides. Now, have a look at this. Here's a piece of typical ore. The ore is in pockets surrounded by carbonate. More important, the galena, which is a good conductor, is surrounded by sphalerite, which is a poor conductor. So the galena is insulated. So you can forget about resistivity methods and electromagnetic methods that rely on currents flowing through sulfide. But there is one method which does give results in the fine point area. That's induced polarization, IP. A regular grid of accurately surveyed lines is cut through the bush to allow the geophysical teams to lay out their arrays of IP electrodes. Electrical energy from a generator is pulsed into the ground in two second bursts from a control cabin. Each pulse, strong enough to kill a horse, passes through cables laid in the bush to the survey area. The current passes between two stainless steel electrodes. One of the electrodes is kept fixed near the generator. The other is initially about a thousand meters down the cut line. This second current electrode is separated by 80 meters from an array of five electrodes, each 80 meters apart. And they are used to measure the electrical potential in the ground beneath. The electrodes are arranged so that the survey can probe the electrical properties beneath the boulder clay and down to about 300 meters in the bedrock where there may be mineralized zones. When a current begins to flow, electrochemical oxidation induces a potential in any easily oxidized minerals. It's much the same as charging up lots of small batteries. When the current is switched off, the charged up parts of the rock discharge over a short period of time. We can look at what happens with a graph of the electrical potential between two electrodes plotted against time. When the current is switched on, a constant potential is created immediately. This lasts for the duration of the burst. With the current off, the potential would drop immediately to zero if there were no easily oxidized minerals present. But where rocks have been charged up, the induced potential remains and slowly decays before the next burst. Just how good a battery the rock is can be estimated by calculating the area under the decay curve. This area is known as the chargeability, and it's measured for four different link-ups between the five potential electrodes. As the distance between the connected potential electrodes is increased, the chargeability corresponds to an increasing depth in the rock directly beneath the midpoint of each electrode pair. To build up a continuous cross-section of chargeability, the whole array of one current electrode and five potential electrodes is simply moved in steps down the cut line. And so progressively, the whole area is mapped as a grid of chargeability values for four different depths. Portable recording equipment is used, and the procedures are simple. The recorder is connected in turn to each potential electrode in the array. The potential is measured electronically, and the data are transferred from the electronic readout to file cards and then relayed to a computer for analysis and machine plotting. So let's see just what it is that's being shown up by IP anomalies like these. For IP to work properly, you've got to have a mineral in the ground that's easily oxidized. But look, this chunk of ore has been lying around at the surface for months, maybe years. And yet the galena and the sphalerite are still nearly as bright and shiny as the way they were formed. These minerals aren't easily oxidized. But there's another sulfide mineral associated with the lead brick ores in small amounts. Iron sulfide. When it's fresh, it's a pale, shiny yellow. But it gets very quickly oxidized, and it goes rusty. 
that's what the IP is picking up. Rusting iron sulfide associated with the lead zinc ore. And so IP gives a rather indirect lead to where the ores are. And to find out more precisely where they are, you have to go and drill. Mobile rigs operate out in the bush in all weathers, drilling cord boreholes through IP anomalies. Every year, hundreds of such holes are drilled. The results of all this geological and geophysical activity provide a wealth of information. The geophysical data go into the preparation of plans and profiles. And the results of the core logging are recorded on cards like this, one for each hole. And the assay of any ore encountered in the hole is put on the back. And of course, all the information that comes in every day goes onto the computer. And it all builds up an increasingly comprehensive and detailed picture of the geology of the limestone barrier reef complex. The distribution of the different rock types, of the uh, dolomite replacements, of the collapse structures, and most important, where the ore bodies are, where they're likely to be, and how big they are. And that's what interests the mine engineers, who all the time want information about ore reserves so that they can plan their pit production to ensure that there's a steady supply of ore to the mill. And here to tell us about how they get that information is the geologist in charge of data processing, Jeannie Allen. This is a composite cross-section of an ore body with the ore intersections marked in red. Between these two marks, we have ore above a cut-off grade, normally 2%. This line here represents the ground elevation. And between the ground and here, we have what we call overburden, a glacial mix of boulders, sand and clay. The remainder of the rock outside the ore intersections is what we call waste rock, the barren limestone. We pick these bench levels to optimise the recovery of the ore, and the benches can vary in height between 4 and 8 metres, depending on the size and type of ore body. Having picked these bench levels, we can then interpolate between drill holes and by statistical means we can obtain figures on the tonnages and grade of the ore. For example, this is a computer contour plan of grade. These black marks are the drill holes with the grade written underneath. And each one of these green lines represents the contour of a particular grade. For example, this line is 5% grade, the centre one here is 8%. In addition to the contour of the grade, we can also produce probability contour plans. And in this instance, this centre line here represents 90% chance of finding the ore in any grade up to 15% in the centre, with the remaining 10% consisting of waste rock. All the information about ore reserves is passed on to the mine engineers. They use it to help them plan new pits and to keep production going in existing pits. And we'll be looking at just how they do that in the next program.